A quick word on our scripture before I begin today. Normally this passage that Leslie read for us is read in the context of another story. Jairus, an esteemed Jewish man coming to ask Jesus to help with his sick daughter. And the story of the sick woman interrupts the story of Jairus and his daughter. It is intentionally sandwiched right in the middle of that other story. It's a writing tactic that the author of Mark uses throughout the whole gospel. But today, as we start our healing stories in the Bible series, we're going to talk about just this middle section of scripture but I encourage you to go home and read the whole thing and let me know if it brings up any different interpretations for you. Let's pray. God of healing and peace, may the thoughts and words that we share in this time be a balm to our souls and bring us closer to you and your love. Amen. So as we start talking about healing in a time when it feels like we need all the more healing and healing and healing, we jump right in talking about bodily healing today. I don't know about you, but when I think of healing stories in the Bible, this story of the hemorrhaging woman is the first one that pops into my head every time. The author makes it clear that this woman is at the end of her rope. She has spent all of her money, and she has not gotten any better. In fact, she's worse than she was before. And this bleeding and this illness, it's gone on for 12 years. She musters up the remaining courage she's got, or chutzpah, or audacity, or whatever you want to call it. And she wiggles her way to Jesus in a crowd full of people, presumably with many, many people touching him in the crowd. And she reaches out, and she touches the edge of his robe, and boom. She feels the change in her body. She is healed. After 12 years of trying who knows what else, she is healed. She stops bleeding. She knows it instantly. Amazing. But if this Bible lesson was trying to show us that the most important part of this story is that the woman's body is healed, the story could stop right there in verse 29. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Body healed, the end, ta-da, that's it. But that's not what happens. The story keeps going. The author is saying, but wait, there's more. The next thing that happens is that Jesus notices something different in his body as well. Despite the fact that an entire crowd of people is pressing in and touching him, which can I also point out that surely in this crowd of people, there was more than just the sick woman who needed healing, right? Like certainly someone had stomach ulcers or an irregular heartbeat or eczema or something. And all of these people are touching Jesus but as soon as the woman touches him and is healed, Jesus notices something different in his body. I imagine Jesus whipping around and yelling, stop, stop, stop for just one second. Who touched me? You can decide if you think that Jesus already knew who touched him and he was just leaving the open space for her to come on her own. Or if he wasn't really sure, if the chaos it was just too much and he couldn't tell who had made this healing moment come through his body. Either way, the woman comes forward and tells the whole truth. And that's when Jesus draws a distinction between her and every other person in the crowd who was there touching him. 
her faith. You know, one could easily preach that this story isn't about the woman's bodily healing at all, really. We could say that this story is about her decision to be bold in her faith. It's a story about her publicly professing the truth to a crowd. Remember, she tells the whole truth, which would have to include that she believes in Jesus so much that she thinks that even touching the edge of his cloak will heal her. Not even his hands, but the edge of his cloak. We could argue that this story is really about not the change in her body, but the change from being an unnamed woman to being called daughter by our Savior. One could preach that all of the healing stories in the Bible where a person's body changes, where it goes from blind to seeing, from a withered hand to a functional one, from crippled legs to walking legs, from death to life. One could say that none of those stories were really about bodily change, but instead about faith and how we change from people to beloved children of God once we meet Jesus. And let me be the first to say that that would be a very good sermon. But if I preach that idea, and maybe someday I will, never say never, I'm hoping to be here a long time, so we'll cycle back. (laughs) But if I preach that idea, I'm left asking, then why bother to share about the bodily changes at all then? If the story is only about a change in in heart or about strong faith that is well or or some part of our soul being healed, why, why even talk about the body? Do we readers of the Bible really need that like sensational symbolism of that outer change to signify what cannot be seen, the presence or growth of faith? I mean, maybe we do. It certainly helps, I think. But here's the thing. Jesus is God incarnate. God in a body. Pinch your cheeks or your hands or something. like God in a body. We believe in a bodily resurrection. Jesus was hungry after the resurrection. He wasn't just some ghost or spirit. His body was alive and it had needs. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus took naps in the boat because he was exhausted. And I'm sure Jesus had head colds, maybe seasonal allergies, He certainly had bumps and bruises and a broken toe with all that walking and sandals. Jesus knows what goosebumps and sweat feel like. Jesus knows what it feels like to gain weight, to lose weight. He blushed. He had pimples and scars and lost his baby teeth. I would even venture to say the other week when Matt was preaching on Jesus and the Canaanite woman who Jesus calls a dog, Jesus might have even been a little hangry every once in a while. That's hungry and angry at the same time. Maybe he needed a Snickers bar. In just a moment, we will repeat Jesus' words. This is my body broken for you. Jesus knows what it feels like to be in a body. God made our salvation possible through God in a body. And as if that isn't enough, I'll throw in the reminder that God created us all in the image of God. There is something about our bodies, and yes, our actions and our thinking and our love, but our bodies that resembles God. God, certainly our bodies are something worth taking care of, 
something worth healing, something worth mentioning in the story, not just the part about changed faith. The miracle of healed bodies is equally as important. So this, I know, raises that big theological question then of why some people's bodies are not healed. Why do some people overcome COVID and almost 200,000 others have not? Why do some folks beat cancer and some succumb? Why are some people healed but not all? These questions are why we're spending seven weeks talking about healing. It's complex. Healing happens in all sorts of different ways, and I promise I will not ignore those questions, and we will talk about them another Sunday. But today, at the beginning of our journey, this healing story shows us that God loves and cares for about the health of our faith and our bodies in equal parts. The woman is healed in body in verse 29, and through the promise of Jesus will be healed. Did you notice that future tense at the end? She will be healed in many more ways as she departs in peace in verse 34. Neither part of the story can be omitted. Jesus cares for her whole being, Our faith is important, and our bodies are important. They are loved by God. So if we think about our bodies and know that Jesus cares about them, how do we treat our bodies differently? What changes about our behavior if we treat our bodies like we treat our faith journey? Do we? eat healthier food? Maybe. Do we eat luxurious food? Because we know that we only live once, and that's one great way to celebrate the joy of God. Maybe that too. Do we listen to what our bodies tell us and then seek help when we need it? Do we treat other bodies, other people, with the same respect and care because those bodies are also created in the image of God, no matter what their ability or shape or color or how many tattoos or the position that they're in or their illness, whether they're healed or not, those are also daughters and sons, the children of God. Do we encourage and celebrate our bodies that God loves by dancing and clapping and singing and hugging and holding hands normally? Do we use the words of uh, one of my favorite Instagram people, Meg Boggs, and say, thank you, body, when this gift from God does amazing things like climb mountains or birth babies or run fast or peacefully breathe or recover from surgery. Thank you, body. Thank you, God. Do we give thanks for the miracle that is modern medicine and science and how that helps our bodies and say, what a time to be alive. I wrote in one of my sermon drafts that any of these things that I just mentioned would be a good goal for me, at least, but they aren't just goals. They're spiritual practices. Loving and caring for our bodies and others is a reflection of God's love for us and our bodies and our faith and all of it. In the next seven weeks, six after today, we're going to talk about all kinds of healing. Healing of our minds and our mental health, healing of family relationships and, and prayer and a bunch of other ways. 
but I hope this sermon will act as a foundation for the rest. The gospel is that God, through Jesus incarnate in a body like ours, cares about us, all of us, our whole selves, our entire well-being, from our faith to our mental health to our relationships to our bodies. Jesus cares about it all and wants us to be well in every sense of the word. This good news is hopefully healing to our hearts and our bodies. May it bring us peace. Amen. <laughs>